welcome to the show. Joining me on the show today are the lead singer from the hit 80s band Modern Romance, Andy Kiriaku, who brought us huge hits such as Everybody's Salsa and The Best Years of Our Lives. Also joining me today is PR guru and record company owner Barry Tomes to talk about the music industry and public relations in the world today. But first, let's talk to Andy. Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Every time I read that, you know, <laughs> the best years of our lives, you, you really start dancing, Andy. Oh, no, yeah. It's one of those songs, isn't it? And the moment you start humming it, that's it. Yeah, you're hooked for the It's there the forever. But how are you? I'm one, thank you. Very Lovely well, to see you. you. We've got so much to talk about. But let's, if the people who don't know you and what you did now, you were the drummer. Originally, 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 yes, yes, the top. So let's go way back, Andy. Tell us a little bit about how you all got together. Um, Brian, well, in essence, the band was formed when I met them, and I bumped into them at this uh, a club, which is very well known to people who are out in the eighties, called the Blitz. It's where the new romantic movement was yes. uh, founded. And um, I went to the Blitz one night with with a friend of mine, and uh, this band had finished playing; they were packing away. And I thought, oh, now I missed the band. I, you know, I've always liked yes. to see a live act. Started talking to somebody in the crowd and said, yeah, were, they, were these guys any good? And they went, yeah, yeah. And the key word for me, somebody said, hell yeah, they were pretty funky. And I thought, oh, you know, because I was a big soul fan. Of yes. I thought, oh, right, okay. So I, go, I went to chat to the drummer and I said, oh, I'm a drummer as well. And if you know any bands that play your kind of music, this is without hearing them. I said, yes. if you anybody that plays your kind of music, yeah. I was looking for a drummer, here's my number. They went, okay, fine. And um, you gave me a call, I got a call a few days later. From that band, yes. Would you like to come up with percussion for us? And I thought, well, it's not drums, but it will do. So get yes, up and dance here. And then before I could get round to it, I got another phone call saying, actually, forget now. Would you like to be our drummer? And I said, what about the guy that I spoke yes. to? And they said, oh no, no, he was on the way out anyway. We're looking for a new drummer because he doesn't soon have purposes, whatever. Yes. And I felt a bit guilty. I was going to say, did you feel bad? I felt like, <laughs> don't tell the guy, and I'm going to take this job. And they said, but if you don't accept it, someone else will, so you might as well get it. So I thought, okay. Can't take it. With a heavy heart, I stole his job. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it turned out, this was a band called Modern Romance, and that was it. Eight weeks later, I was on top of the pops. And I didn't realise they had a record deal in place. Oh, so did you know anything about what? I knew nothing about them. I just saw them, and the, I just saw them finishing their, their, their gig. Yes. Spoke to the drummer, and, and then in the first rehearsal, somebody was chanting, and I went, "Excuse me, what did you say?" I heard the word record company. Oh, sorry, have you got a record deal? Oh, very casually. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've got a record deal. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful, Mars. Yes. And then in the same breath, they said, "Oh, yes, we've released two singles, and they flopped." And we'd oh. be told if the next one's a flop, they're throwing us with the mate. <laughs> so I was like, up oh, there one second, and then I was like, oh, no, that right, really. Then. Well, back to the music industry. Yes, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. <laughs> but the third single was a song called Everybody Sells Up. Which was a huge hit. Huge hit. Massive. And how did you feel, you know, playing on that? Well, in actual fact, they'd recorded it before I joined. Right. So it says, this is their next single, it's already been recorded, blah, blah, blah. And I, I have to admit, because I came from a very kind of funk soul driven background i mean i was a massive david bowie fan Must. my music influences were soul funk and then they played this thing everybody sounds that and i wasn't into pop music at the time but i mean it changed obviously after that but i heard this song and i went it's a bit poppy so like, what is this <laughs> but i thought all right let's go with it let's go with the flow you're here now um and actually fact, i had musicians the fellow musicians come up to me afterwards who Knew the bands I played, and I played them with got a funky kind of like you know jazz funk band. Yes. And I remember somebody coming up to me at a party, and he went, "Andy, I went, is it how's it going?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, fine." And he went, "Everybody sells these, and it's really." And I said, "Hang on a second. I said I played in all these jazz funk bands, all these little soul bands. No, I knew the hell we were. I said, all of a sudden, I played one song, Everybody Sells It. I can't walk down the street anymore. I said, but everyone knows you well. Yeah. I said." This, this is a music well, yeah. we have to deal with it. Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> but how lovely for you. Isn't that fortuitous as well? And in those times, did you feel the idea? In those, you know, I'd say in those times, so it's like it's, it's hundreds of years ago, but in the 80s, musicians were very much a part of each other, weren't they? You know, it was very much, well, what do you do? You know, in the, in the green rooms, in the dressing rooms, everybody used to chat and, and, and collaborate and, yeah, you know, and share. And... I'm sure it still happens now. I'm sure it does. Well, I know it does. But obviously, that's... 
that generation of musicians, it was a kind of new thing. Yes. Everybody collaborating. Yes, that's way. right. It didn't really happen before the 70s. No. Um, and you had people saying, oh, yeah, I'll come and play on your album. Come, I'll come and do a bit of singing, you know. Yes. So yeah. it's really, it's really good. That's really amazing. Hard. So you did that. And then how long were you uh, with Hold Tomorrow Nights as a drama? Um, till 1980, I think it's 85. We all started to go as a proper yes. Go to his, we channeled yes. the world, we did yeah. some great things. But What's your favourite place to play? Well, my favourite place in the world has got to be New York. Yeah. But um, if I'm talking about a particular gig that I would say my favourite gig, my favourite setting has got to be Japan. Really? I love Tokyo. It was just amazing. What was it? The audience? The people just... were just amazing. Um, and we had, we, had, we had this really strange thing where when we arrived in Japan, um, we arrived in Tokyo, the airport was just full of people. It was ridiculous. I've, I've never seen... I don't get I was young, and I've never yes. seen anything like this. And all of a sudden, it was like, watching, it was like watching the films of, of, of David Cassidy and Big yes. Romania. Yes. All of a sudden, they're there for us. And I'm thinking, this oh, she's very bizarre. Yes. Yeah. And they all knew our names again. Andy, I bought you, they bought us presidents. They got good these gifts, they all wrapped up these nice things. And um, we chatted to everyone at the airport as many as we could, you know, with the security, because obviously it was a bit mad, we were a bit like, oh, you know. So we chatted to loads of people and I've uh, got on the tour bus and we're waving to these people. We're waving, oh, I sit at the game, we'll see you at the gig. Like, yeah, yeah, see you later, bye. And we go off through the streets of Tokyo and we arrive at the hotel, people outside the hotel. Yes. We go, oh, yeah, this is, this is amazing. You know? And then someone went, hang on a minute. They're the same people that were outside the other place. They'd be in us too. And we're sitting there, how did they manage that? You know, well, of course, they've got a metro. Yes, you know, that's places. right, yes. And, and then the same with you. We left the hotel before we had stuff in the hotel yeah. and left and went to the venue for the show. So we're on the tour bus, went to the venue, full of people outside. But my friend, hang on, it's the same people. It's the same people. <laughs> and it, but it was amazing. They were just How so not sort of dedicated. It was great. So after that, then what do you, you So you continued this kind of world tour of, of, of doing what you were doing, still a drummer. Yep. And then, as you say, you, then you all went your separate ways. Yeah, they went our separate ways in about 85, 86. Was that kind of, you know, mutual? Did you, were you all doing different things then? Not, it's one of those things where I think to, it just reaches a, a dead end, you know, people are, are getting different. Lots of bands do that, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they get the yeah. anxious people want to yeah. play this sort of music or that, or someone's not into it anymore. And um, So I started doing some session drumming. That's all I was doing for years. Uh, drumming with different people, different bands. And then in 1999, I saw that the 80s thing was coming back. Yes. And, um, you know, I'd seen that Odyssey had done a few gigs and a few different bands, you know, and I thought, we thought, we want to get in on this. Mm. So I phoned up Dave, who was the bass player of the band, and said, look, we should probably get together and do this thing, you know. So we had a chat, we had a meeting, and um, he said to me, look, he said, I cannot see myself on stage again, ever. He said, it's not my thing, I don't want to do it anymore. Which for me is like really bizarre because I can't see myself doing anything else. Yes, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, but she then, said, she yeah. said, look, your job on the stage is sweeping it. I would do it because I'm on the stage. I don't yes. think I want to be up there. Yeah, so, performing. Yeah, yes. it's very strange. So, um, but, yeah, plenty of credit's due. He um, he said, I'm, I'm never going to do this. He said, but you're an original member. You know, you were there from the first hit. From the first TV show, you were there all the way through to the end. He said, you're as entitled as anyone else to do it. He said, um... Go and do it. He said, I don't know the name, but he said, hey, so he has signed the name to me. He said, right, here's the name, all yours, legally done. That was very kind of him, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Sorry, and um, so I decided to just pull bands together. So I started with two of the musicians from the well, you're good and you're a great bass player. Yeah. Right? And um, and the only person I couldn't find was a singer. I and mean, this was, we auditioned loads of singers and they would come in and would give them a song to sing. We'd say, sing a song of Road Joyce. And then we're going to give you one very much. So come in and do a Phil Collins number, a Richard Marks number, anyway. Like, and they'd be great. I'd sit there and go, oh, oh, this is great. I love this. And then when they sang the word romance, song, they would struggle. Who was sitting in there put their pop songs, you know. And then someone said, have you not realised they're all in the high key? These guys that sing these songs are not going to be able to sing the romance songs because they're all up there. And in the end, someone, some bright sparks, and they said, there's no... Like, because I used to do the harmonies so I can sing it. Yes. And they said, right, well, that's it. You're going to have to be the singer. And I was so, me. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyone who's a musician, drummers in particular, yeah. would understand this. Singing with a headset mic, you're on the drum kit, fine. Yes. Not bothered. 
sing to the cows. Because you're off to the back of the stage. No, no, yeah, it's fine. But, but mentally, you've got this thing around you yes. in your cupboard or something. Yeah. Hearing you and Mike and throwing you out in the front of the stage is a completely different thing. I was petrified. I was, mm-hmm. I was actually shaking for the first piece, physically shaking. It took months for me to bring it under control. Months, probably about, I'd say a year and a half before I got to the point where I was never nervous. I'd start off and I'd be nervous for the first 25, 30 minutes yes. on the show itself. But then it got to like 15 minutes. And and then got, right. Until in the oh. end, I got to like th- three minutes before you're nervous and then you don't want to do it. Stop you there, but we're going to take a quick break, but come back and join us in just a minute. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Andy Kiriaku from Modern Romance. And Andy, before the break, we were talking about you know the nervousness of being a lead singer with how, oh my gosh. That, I mean, especially for a drummer, because drummers are always at the back. Yep. Mainstay of the band. Uh, you know, my son is a drummer, so I'm always, always, you know, pro drummers. But they are, you know, they are the sort of, the, the kind of key to the sound yeah, of the band. To so suddenly do that, to come to the front, that must have been very nerve-wracking. It, it was daunting to say the least mm. and, and I, I remember when somebody said well, there's no there's no other choice you'll have to be a lead singer and i was like initially i thought no, no. yeah once i accepted it i thought yeah you're fine and as the day got closer it was like oh my god you're going to be singing in front of people at the front of the stage no drum kit to hide behind no, you know that's sort it's, of it's, it's a mental yes. thing yes you know there's no drum kit there to hide you from people and it's like mm. well you've done um, very well very well with it. Now, who are the other members of the band at the moment? Um, who have you got? got that... Matt's been my drummer for ages. Mm-hmm. He, uh, Matt flies in from Sweden to do the gigs. Because he married the Swedish girl here in the UK. Went back to Sweden because he loves it there. Yeah. Uh, went to Sweden with her and they've had a second child over there and he lives there. But I just sent him text, Matt, got a gig. Right, like, okay, fine. It's in the diary. Flies over on the Friday. The gigs on a Saturday, for example. Excellent. Flies over, does the gigs on Saturday. Flies back on Sunday. Brilliant. Keyboard player Steve flies in from Spain. He's done the same. He, and he's, he's, <laughs> he's Is gone, there anybody here? He's gone for the sunny climate, whereas Matt just loves... Yeah. I mean, oh, it's I'll a bit for the sunny climate. It's a bit Matt thing. He said, he goes, I mean, it's not a massive drinker, but he said, do you know, I had, a, I had a beer in the most northern, most inhabited place <laughs> on the planet. Where was that? Somewhere up north. That they're, so they're really like northern. Yes. Near the North Pole. Yeah. The closest you can get to. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and he said, and they said, um, yeah, I had a beer on there. And I said, oh, great. And he said, yeah, <laughs> when I went to the toilet, I said, I've just gone to the toilet. And they said, oh, they're out of it. And I turned to go, and they go, no, hang on a second, because you'll need this. He said, he gave me a gun. So what's that for? He said, in case there's a bear on the what's way. What's a bear? There's a bear come, especially to protect yourself. It's not every day you meet a bear going to the toilet. No, I'm not going to that toilet. <laughs> exactly. They call me nuts. You've got this band now. You've been there. So how long have you been sort of with this band? I mean, they've been with me for years now. Yeah. Also, one of the people that sings with me, on merit, I have to say, not because it's uh, nepotism. Yes. My daughter is a singer in the band. I have to yeah. sing with you, yes. Uh, how that came about is, um, I mean, obviously, she's my daughter. Yes, yeah, so I was yeah. And she was always singing and playing stuff and doing yes. things. And one day I was walking around the house, and the obvious sometimes is in your face, and yes. you just don't see it. And I was walking around, and I heard her singing. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know. Then a penny dropped. I mean, she's singing up Whitney Houston songs and stuff like that and doing them justice. I'm walking around the house and I thought, you idiot. You've got a voice like that in your house and you have session singers come and do backing vocals for you. So are you. She was 15 at the time. So um, I walked in, I said, hi, Nat. I said, um, do you fancy being a kid with modern romance? And you know what they're like, 15. Yeah, you know? 15. They know everything. Yes, that's how she they're not knowing everything, but you're like really confident. Yes, like, yes. Dismissive. Yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I said, um, she went, yeah, how many people will you be? And I went, oh, not a lot. I said, about 16,000 people. And she went, excuse me, what? <laughs> ah, you'll give me this chance. That's right, yeah. And she was like, oh. And I said, well, is that a problem? And she said, no, not really. Excellent. And she came to the gig, and I remember... I have a complete contrast to my first gig as a singer. All right, nice. I came from a drum as a drummer first. But I said to her the day, are you nervous? And she went, no. I thought, you're 15, how can you not be nervous? But I've seen her before, Mandy, yeah. and she, she doesn't appear nervous in the least. That's just a, how come you're nervous? She said, well, to be honest, Dad, she said, I'd, I'd be more nervous if I sang in front of people in the school because I have to face them the next day. 
But she's these people, I'm not going to see them again. So if I can mess anything up, they won't go. So she's a sort of mainstay of your band now? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I'll give her little solo spots. You know, I'll just walk off and go, right, you do your thing. Yeah. And she rocks it every time. She's really good. And I mean, I, I went to one of her gigs because she does gigs with her own little band. And um, I went on Mother's Day and she she did these songs that she's written that I haven't heard before because normally when she writes at home, I can hear stuff. But yes. I hadn't heard these. And she deliberately kept them quiet because she wanted to surprise me. She sang these songs. And I was kind of like, these are very... I mean, the lyrics are just like, oh. Yes. And, um, no, I just don't feel... Star and making. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Is it probably you've got that kind of musician feel through the family? You know, you're very musical, obviously, obviously as a family. Um, and it, does it still give you the same amount of pleasure as it did, to, you know, when you first started in the 80s, Andy? Absolutely. Well, I mean, music is so much a part of our lives in the house anyway. Um... But me, so I have everything to do with music. If I can't get in the car without music. I'll, music's in the house. And um, if there's, I, mean, I can't go to every gig I'm invited to, but I'm invited to a lot of gigs. And I try and go because I want to see musicians. I want to see musicians when they're, you know, creating yes. stuff, when they're at the early part of their, you know, on the early path, finding yes. their way. I think it's all very interesting. And you can always learn, you know, two plus and eight. Oh, yeah, but they, they knew. So what? They could do something and we go, do you know what? Never thought of doing that. Brilliant. When you see the new musicians come through, do you, is there a difference? Do you feel that there's a difference now, you know, within the music industry as as to when you started? I think the main difference, and it's not a musical difference, I think the main difference is people are less focused on their appearance. I don't mean that in a horrible way. No. But everybody in the 80s, you know, you had... You say Flock of Seagulls, everyone could see the, the yes, head that's head. right. You yes. say Kajakubu, they all know. Absolutely. Whereas now, if you keep any bands, people go, they know the songs, I'm talking about the general public, yes. not the fans of each individual yes. band, but the general public will know the songs, but they haven't got a picture in the head of that band because that band doesn't have a specific image mm -hmm. that stands out, like Adam and, and like Toya and like Dennis Pete. Because in those days, it, it was very much your makeup, it yeah. was nails, it was hair, it was... Full on. It was a board of Full on. It was the image plus mm. the songs plus everything. Even record companies would look at you and say, oh, you haven't got much of an image. Whereas you've walked in with a sock hanging off your ear and a couple of clothes pegs hanging off yeah. your nose. <laughs> oh, that's different. Yes. Right, now we listen to your music. Yes. You know, all of a sudden you've got their attention. It's very true. Perte perception then was very different to how, how it yeah, is yeah. now, is it? And and how are you sort of finding that, you know, doing your gigs? Obviously, you're really, really popular. You've been doing gigs all over the country still. Um... Is that something you're going to continue, Andy? I will continue doing the music literally until I, I physically can't. If I can't walk anymore, I can't do anything, or I drop down dead, then that's when I'm going to stop. But I, I, it's all I know. And what do I do? Sit at home and hear about other people doing gigs and go, yeah, I'd like to do it, but I've retired now. Well, I'm 65 today. I'm not Happy retiring. Day. Thank you. <laughs> I am not retiring. Yes. It's just not going to happen. Yes. Um, I will work and see what I can know. They'll work. drag you out of, yeah. up of the stage. Yeah. But what a lovely way to go, though, Andy, because clearly you, st you still enjoy it. And especially it. with your daughter, you know, you, you'll be able to do more things with her because I'm assuming that her young kind of spirit and her attitude to music maybe will spur you to write different songs and maybe... Different directions. Well, I said to her Richard that we really ought to write something together. Yes, you um, should, definitely. She, I, I try not to get involved in her songs because they're youthful songs and they're of her experiences. Yes. But once recently she played me a song and I went, that bit there, so she changed that and do that. And never heard anything from her again. And then she played that song on the Mother's Day gig. And yeah. she did it the way I told her to do it. And he really worked. The crowd got and I said to her, see, said, if Dad knows that thing or two. She pretended not to listen to it, she is. Yeah. I don't know, she didn't disregard yeah. it. She just yeah. went, oh, okay. And then she carried on doing what she was doing. I've never heard from her again with that song or anything yes. else. She carried on in her room, program and yes. doing what she does. But then when she played it, she, you know, she uh, utilised that. And it did work. Mm. And I was joking afterwards, I said, let's see, your dad knows a thing or two. <laughs> not a lot. <laughs> and are you writing at the moment? Not really, but only because... I'm a prolific writer in that if you said to me, we need to write a song mm -hmm. in the next couple of days about this, I will probably do it about an hour. Let this play the melodies. You write quite quickly. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I need to have a goal to yes. sit there. I don't sit there and just write. I mean, sometimes I walk past a keyboard and I go, I'll just play a few things. I go, oh, 
and play a little bit, enjoy it then, and just leave it. And that's it. I won't sit there writing full song because I've got the idea and then we'll go back to it, it'll be done. I actually need to be... And it kind of a goal. Yeah, I need songs yeah. to go, yeah, we're doing this, girl, come on, I saw it. They could have the smallest little musical thing. And I thought, oh, yeah, and it would trigger a whole raft of ideas and songs and things. And they'd go, how did you get that from that? But I need that spark. Yeah. Do you miss your jobs? I do. Yeah. I've got a set, I've got a, got a kind of set at home. Mm -hmm. um, Once drum, I always a drum. And I sat down only a couple of weeks ago for the first time in ages and played for an hour and a half. I put on um, Earth, Wind & Fire Live from yes. Alvin and I drummed with it from beginning to end and it was fantastic. <laughs> and I thought, I see, I've just played with Earth, Wind & Fire. That's a yeah, yeah, that's a but, um, <laughs> but that was great, it was great, I really enjoyed it. I thought, well, they're not going to do this more often, but it's like everything. So you could do something like that and you could, um, you know, just do a, a drum solo set. Do you know, I had a friend say to me last year, he said, you really ought to go and play the drums for a little bit and yeah. show everyone you can do. And I, I'm not like that. I said, look, listen, I'm here as a singer. I've got Matt as a drummer and he's fantastic. Um, I, I don't need to go and show you that I can play the drums. Yeah. Don't give me that. No, I'm doing my bit. He's doing his bit. And I've got that show that you know I mean? It's like... Well, Andy, it's fabulous to uh, to see you and talk to you and catch up on the wonderful band, Wonder Robots. Thank now, you. my next guest is actually Barry Tones, who's <coughs> a good friend of yours. So I was going to ask you, would you be prepared just to hang around? Yeah, absolutely. Hang yeah. around and have a chat with Barry about the good old days. Okay, all right. All all right. right. Thank the you. Robinson skeletons. Oh, there. well, we won't, we'll, we'll bring them all out. Okay, so come back and join us in just a minute. Welcome back to the show, and we are here talking to Andy Kiriaku from Modern Romance, but also Barry Tomes has joined us, who's PR guru and record owner. Hello, Hello Barry. How are you? Thank you for inviting me. We love your Modern Romance, <laughs> meeting. We love your mom. <laughs> I thought, well, you two go way back, so I thought this is an ideal opportunity for you to just have a chat, really, and, and tell us about the music industry. Obviously, we've been talking to Andy about his career with Modern Romance and how that's much that's changed and how he's still really enjoying it. And for you, Barry, you've been in the music industry for 52 years, years, yeah. Started when I was one, yeah. You know, you know, <laughs> you know obviously, of Andy and How, you know, has it changed much? What, what's the situation now with our music industry? Yeah, massively, really. I mean, obviously, I, I've known the guy for years and years. Happy birthday, well, Yes, happy birthday. And, and I mean, telling you. before he joined the band, he said there was a track record. Well, I also know Lewis, who was a session musician, right. but playing a lot of the tracks. So yeah. I knew him really well. He played a lot of stuff. He was a percussionist, yeah. 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 Played all the stuff. So I knew him before I knew Andy. And uh, modern romance and that era, which was about, I'd say, 81 to 84 for me, was probably the main time. That was when I realised the music business had changed. I'm a 70s boy. I was, you know, I was a T-Rex, sweet, mud, and yes. all that sort of stuff. Um, in the 80s, when I'd been in the music business, I'd been in the music business for about 10 years. I'd worked with Alvin Stardust in the 70s. I knew then that there was money to be made from records, not just an artist signing a pack, getting royalties. I knew there was money to be made. And, and for example, Andy's got a new single out now, right? So if he says, yeah, Barry, you've got Gotham Records, I'll put our single out. I can put the single out. I'll do a deal with you. We'll bet 50 to 50 of whatever's made because we'll make no money anymore from the recordings. Unless it gets in a movie or a TV commercial, you're going to get 12p from Spotify. So that, you know, as many plays you get. But if he come to me 20 yeah. years ago yeah. and said, Barry, I've got a track. Mm. Do you like it? At first thing I said, I don't care. You're modern romance. You have a brand. I have a record label. And even if it wasn't a hit yet, this was a brand new song, I could have took that track and I could have put that on 30 to 40 compilations around the world. Mm. And every single compilation would have paid us money from two, two, so it's £250 to five thousand dollars or five thousand euros and that's how we would make money and so it was that that period where i realized as a record company i can make money because one of the things back in the day it, it, i mean the chart now is just compiled from plays spotify streams all that nonsense there's no reality anymore i think mike reads every charts is the closest you get to reality but i remember thinking at the time right on average 400 singles were released each week. Now that's a physical release, cassette, a CD, vinyl. About 400. Only on average, every week, eight got in the chart. Well, that's 392 failures, isn't it? Now, when I realized 
If there are more failures than successes, find a way to make money at the phones. Now, the, the one person that made money at the failures was the CD pressing plant because they pressed 10,000 copies of record that didn't get in the chart and they all got destroyed, but they got their money. I thought, well, if that's a good song that Andy's done and he hasn't gone in the top yes. 40, and that's a good song that Bad Band's done, wait a minute, I'm going to send that to my friend in Japan or my record company, so-and-so, so-and-so. And before you know it, we were making money from the non-hit records. We actually made, in 1997, we made £47,000 from a non-hit record. And that's how you made money. But now, I don't know how you make money now. I mean, that, that's what I'm seeing here. You're, you're chatting between the two people. Yeah. I'm shaking Sorry, mate. Sorry. Like, <laughs> he's chatting. Everything he says, I'm shaking my head. Okay? Yes. Because it's all true. He's, he's, he's a completely different animal now. Um, Spotify. Oh, oh, don't even give me going. Well, lots of, um, you know, very, very well-known singers have actually, you know, dropped out of Spotify, mm. haven't they? Because they, they said you've got to sell... How many songs? Well, when, you know when we did the Let's Rock to you, you did yeah, the Let's yeah, Rock yeah. which was phenomenal. I think yes. you went to one of those. Yes, you met the And, was about that, and right. that was an awesome gig. And I had Fuzzbox on the tour. Yes. Now, Fuzzbox, we released a single, and we, I was like, wow, we've had 128,000 streams this week. We got eight pence. No, yeah, we got, well, what can you do with eight pence? <laughs> There's five in the band, that's a penny. It's free beef. It's it's mate, the only that. people that can make money from sponsors yeah. are our people like Ed Sheeran. Yeah. Yes, he's yeah. out. But even then, payments. even those people, if they looked at what they're getting and they're getting X amount, yeah. I'd imagine yeah. that But then if they looked into we're actually, uh, if we were getting paid properly, we'd get four times, yeah. five times. Yeah. Spotify just making money mm. on the backs of... If they got the royalty per sale, like say when you'll hear that Ed, say Ed Sheeran's got two million, three million streams. If he got royalties per stream, like he did per vinyl or book yeah. head. Yes. He'd be making 20 million for every song, not just a couple of million. It's interesting because, and also, you know, when, you know, you've the, again, the young generation, of, it's all Spotify. That's what you do. You know, that's you. Yeah. Um, you both, of course, because it's his birthday, happy birthday, and we say it again. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but when, when we download their songs, as I do, you know, as loads of, hundreds and hundreds of people do, it, it's lots of the um, songs that you have on your phone, you don't actually own, do you? And unless no. you've actually downloaded them, and but even you, then you don't own them. Is that right? Own, if you download a song from, from say, iTunes mm. and you buy it and you pay 79p, whenever I released a record, the first thing I would do is at midnight on the release date, I'd buy the single because yes. and I knew the system was working. But I didn't own that song. You know, I'd put it on Spotify. I, I'd put it onto iTunes. You're only licensing it from iTunes for the 79p. So you never actually physically no, have the record? No, you might own the original master. Do you think that's why and in vinyls, you know, we've seen a, a big revival, yeah. haven't we, in vinyl and cassettes even. I mean, Billie Eilish, yeah. not this album, but the one before, she actually sent out with her kind of pre-order copy. It was a it was a pink um, cassette. Yeah. I remember showing that to them. They were like, oh, now I remember cassettes. Uh, uh, you know, but the young generation would not remember or even know what a cassette was. No, they wouldn't. Um, but I think that but they're making a comeback now. They're making a big comeback because right. the thing is with the vinyl, where with the set, but more so with the vinyl because there's more space. But you can read about the single. We feel yes. when you download something, you just downloaded a WAV file. Or whatever yeah, a file, yeah. Yes, and that's it. You don't know anything about. You think there's a trumpet on there. I wonder who played yeah. that. Yes, who exactly. wrote? Right. Yeah, it's very true, actually. And the sound from the vinyl the, yes. is so rich. And the back to vinyl was always the full list of all uh, yeah. all the artists. And you often yeah. get stories in the vinyl, yeah, yeah, don't you? Yeah. It was often yeah. stories. But it's as as just the sound as well was much richer. Oh, oh, nice. I mean, I've still got vinyl at home and I've still got a record player, which I do play. I yes. do play. You know, the so you are. Are. Yes. We do as well. Yes. Different yes. sound. Different yeah. sound. Do you feel that we're ever going to go back to that, or is that it now? Is, it, is this the music? We, I don't. I don't know if you ever go back. I think what's happening is people are buying vinyl now, and when they buy vinyl, let's say, let's say under twenties for the minute, they buy a vinyl and they pay about forty quid now for a vinyl album. My last vinyl album cost me six quid. You know, when they're in the jar, so they're buying them because they're buying a thing. Because young people don't have things anymore. So it's that physical it's entity, thing. and they often don't play the vinyl, which is a shame because they get a free code to download the album as well, which is a good thing if you're right. traveling or you're on the phone, but they don't play the vinyl, so they don't hear the rich sound. They don't get the benefit and of that. Until thing. you play a piece of vinyl after you've just played a track on CD, you don't know what you're missing. I think we won't go back to vinyl the way we were, but I think there'll be a lepping out at one point where you'll get um, a generation or a group of people, a large group, you know, where they go, I don't buy CDs, I buy vinyl, because I yeah. like there will be people that realise actually the sound is better, yeah. and I've got that added bonus of 
information that I don't have on the back yes. of the sleeve, on the in, inner sleeve. There's all this. There's, there's always an in, there was always an inner yeah, sleeve. There's all, there's there's all these areas where you can put information and little yes. booklets and stuff. Try. You can't. I mean, even if you do download a booklet, even if that was possible. People aren't going to go, why did you say this? Let me switch on my la and laptop and see who, yeah. who did the backing yeah. vocals on this. It yeah. sounds like so. You're not going to bother. But if you've got the album there, you go, let's have a quick look. Yes, it sounds yeah. like, And then you'll carry on. Yeah. Yes. And I think there will be eventually a leveling out where people, it won't run up be 50 50, but you'll get people that are dedicated, vital people. Yes. It'll keep yeah. increasing. Yeah. 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 Well, Andy, we're going to be playing listening or even looking at your lovely video now tell us about this video we're gonna hit we're gonna watch um right it was recorded uh one of the buttons Butlins. yeah <laughs> the wild running was crazy brilliant yeah. but brilliant night no, Matt. But people that go to buttons i have to say if you've never been to well 80s gigs generally <laughs> yes if you've never been to an 80s gig like one of these retro gigs you need to put your spandex on <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but i mean people come dressed as Adam Man. Yeah, they do. The Blues Lots Brothers. Of hair. It's brilliant. Yeah, yes. Storm, uh, Stormtroopers, Nine Skippers of the Woodby Feldberg film, um, loads of stuff, and they just come and have a great time. And it, it's very bizarre because you're standing there singing and you're singing to an American cop, a yeah. Freddie Mercury, yeah. a Michael yeah. Jackson, and a, 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 a B on board, you know, with yeah. the headband and everything. Well, I'm going to look forward to watching it, but thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Barry, you're going to be staying here, but Addy, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, thank, thank you. you. Cheers, mate, good to okay. see you. Okay, nice so see you. let's watch this fantastic video and come back and join me in just a minute. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Um, Andy's now left us, but I'm here still with Barry Tones. Barry, PR guru and record company owner. Now, just before we were talking, I had some really lovely chats with um, Andy, talking about the music industry and how much it's changed. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you feel has changed quite dramatically? Well, with the music the whole, industry? It's all changed. The entire music industry, I knew it when I started in 1972, it was all changed. My biggest worry is, I'm not worried for Alton John only getting 600 million on his farewell tour that took four years. I'm not really worried about Sting not selling 200,000 albums a week anymore or Oasis selling, you know, a million albums because I think they've done all right and if they've got to be very, very bad businessmen to lose that money. My worry is 10 years from now, I'll probably be about 35, something like that. In about 10 years from now, what musicians will we have and will they actually own a home? Because... There's no investment going back in. And I know that as a record company. The first song I ever recorded for my own label, Gotham Records in 1989, cost me £12,500 to record. My sister bought a house for £12,500 in the terrace oh, house the same year. She's still got that. It's worth £140,000. I've got a cassette that nobody wanted to listen to. That was £12,500 for the recording, £20,000 for a video, and, but we invested the money. That 20000 for the video employed cameramen, it employed makeup artists, it employed stylists. So lots of people were getting the employment. It's not happening anymore. And a musician, you know, the best way to describe a musician is someone who's got a car worth 300 quid driving 400 miles with five grand's worth of equipment to earn 50 quid. And that's a musician. And What's that's that? the reality of what we do. Alan John's talking about bringing back his management company, Rocket Management, as he finishes his tour. I hope he does, because I think, I think he generally wants to help artists. 
I worry for that middle level of artists. And what killed it was, for, for years and years and years, there were gigs seven days a week, even the lunchtime on a Sunday or lunchtime on a Saturday. X Factor killed that. And how X Factor killed it was, and I know it's give us a few careers and there's a few millionaires, but the entire industry that worked seven days a week, they stopped employing those artists on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because on a Friday and a Saturday, they would have the X Factor artists, not even the winners, the one that was kicked out the previous Saturday, would go on a club this Friday and a club this Saturday. And they'd pay 30000 for that because X Factor was on the telly. And you got all of the ones that lost right up till the second or third. All that money changed hands just for X Factor and big agents. So a whole group of what you call middle artists stopped earning money. I worry sick there that record companies, you know, I sold a Range Rover once to get some tapes back because the Spanish record company had recorded an album. Yes. And they went bankrupt. So I sold my Range Rover to get the tapes back to buy a Mac. Who's doing that now? Who's doing that now for, you know, Andy's daughter, mm -hmm. young people that have got great voices, brilliant songwriters. Because as a songwriter now, unless you get a song in a film or a TV commercial, um, you're not going to make any money. It's interesting you say that because there are hundreds and hundreds, aren't there, of new songwriters coming through. Thousands. Very, very talented yeah, uh, singer-songwriters. And often, because the way the charts work, they don't actually ever get a, a voice, do they? And, and you know, we have there's various shows, um, BBC Introducing is one, where they introduce new artists, new up-and-coming artists. Um, there's the Brit Awards, which, of course, the Brit Academy... Um, aspires to having lots of new artists, but where are all these good, talented singers going to go to? Is it is it pure luck now? Do they host It's always been years? luck. There's always been a, a big element of luck. However good you are, I've always said that talent will not get you there. It will not get you there. It will keep you there. What gets you there is Barry Thomas Morgan in his house to make an album for you because he believes in you as a manager or a record company putting up 30 grand to go on a support act or support two of the girls allowed. Yes. And that's that's all that's gone because record companies are making no money. As I said to you earlier on, we made 47,000 from a non-hit record in 1987 because we licensed it all over the world. And if we'd have had a modern romance song 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we'd have made 30 grand for non-hit because we'd have been on, I would have had it on seven compilations in Japan and, and he talked about Japan because it was a favourite place yes. to go. I loved it. He's absolutely right. It was just the most surreal place I've ever been to in my life. But I would have had, say, a, a, um, a modern romance song on there, seven compilations, non-exclusive, and probably got between five hundred and a thousand dollars from each one. So all of a sudden, we got eight grand from one country, and then you get another ten grand from Germany. We used to get like seventy-five quid from Czechoslovakia, but we get five hundred dollars from Israel. We've had records in every country all over the world. And that allowed me to invest in new artists that we would thought we were going to be the big one, really. I mean, so what do they do? I mean, what would you what would your recommendation be or advice be to, to, to an aspiring new artist? How, how would they get seen? How would their music well, be heard? It, first of all, I'd, I'd say don't give up. If you do what you do and you're good at doing it, cream always rises to the top. X Factor ruined that because people would come in at number one and then go down the charts. Instant start. Instant. Isn't it? But they were idiots and they're often not that talented because they had voice coaches, they had stylists, they had everything possible to make a television. And all, all X Factor ever was was EastEnders with a prize. It was a TV show. It's not about music. It's not about. Because the same few people were writing the songs. Simon Calderon, I adore, I adore. He was making millions and I don't begrudge him that. But it was never invested in, in, in the roots of music. And I, all I could say to anybody is, don't give up. Keep doing it. Keep doing what you're doing. It will find a way. Music will always find a way. Will you be able to have a home in Florida, a home in um, Spain and a home in London? Probably not. But you'll have a great life if you're in the music business. And, I mean, as you say, it, then it takes a lot of, not only just luck, but a lot of... Um loyalty to the task isn't it really you've got to yeah. be really you've got to be really really focused yeah. and uh, quite disciplined would you say well you, you have to be to succeed as i say i don't ever believe that the talent got you there i don't believe someone said he's talented he's number one 
it, it came from an investment of a group of people, your family often, your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you, you know, your manager put the money in. In the end, if you got up there and you were talented, you flew. You flew because you had wings. If you were rubbish, and, and you know I'm a, I'm a publicist mostly nowadays, the amount of times I've done a campaign and a, and a publicity campaign to promote not just songs, it could have been a book or even a TV show, and people have said, if only the song was as good as the campaign, that would have been number one. Right. Because yeah. and, no, but that's been said to yes. me a lot. Well, I wanted to talk to you about that because you said, you know, you are a PR, mm, PR mm, guru is your yeah. name. Now, you've been doing PR for many years, Barry. Mm -hmm. So and how has that changed and, and how do you, how is your role? How do you see your role in that? Well, I call myself a publicist now. I own a record company and it's my personal jukebox. I can release what I want. Do I expect to make money? No. But I do love seeing my name on a record and I love to see it out there doing stuff. But as a publicist now, you're looking for a story and then you put the song in the story. Whereas before, you would have a song and then EMI would come to you and say, right, we need some PR for this. So you say, oh, hang on. The drummer's dad used to work with Robert Plant in a factory. So you use that as the story. Now, you make up a story and they say, anybody got a good song to go with the story? Mm -hmm. The only difference is the news of the world used to buy us 25 grand stories. We're down to about 15 <laughs> grand now. So, there's no money in this anymore. The, 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 there's there's, money, in, there's yeah. money in publicity. There's, there's no money in music. And that breaks my heart because that's what I'm about. Yes. But the reason I've been able to carry on working with artists, carry on touring the world, carry on supporting people through my record lab, it's because I'm a publicist who earns a lot of money. Yes. So and that, that. So it's that really. And how do you feel that's changed globally? Is that, is that, have we seen a shift in publicity. the way, yeah, in the way well, publicity is yeah, seen? And perhaps... Publicity was, was clever. It used to be clever, whether it was, you know, Ozzy Osbourne biting a bat on stage, which you never did, or, or you know, Freddie Star ate my hamster. They, they, were, they were very clever things. Now, people say, make me famous. And I said, well, I'll make you famous. Set fire your clothes, run down the street, you'll be in all the newspapers tonight. But it's not a story. Interesting you say that because they did a recent poll, a, st a study with, I think it was 21 to 25 year olds, and what they wanted to be, number one thing, was they wanted to be famous. Yeah, but they don't know what for. Yeah. They're famous for being famous, and that doesn't last. I've had people on like Celebrity Big Brother, you know, some of the artists I've worked with, some of the stories are outrageous, but they're good, strong stories. And I always say, but when I'm getting a story, if you come to me with a story, it's your story. So I will sell your story if I think we can sell it. Because it's for the publisher, the Sun, the Star, or whichever paper, to decide, is that the truth? Do we risk legal action? So I never, ever have to tell the truth or a lie, because it's never my story. Because in reality, in life, there are three truths. There's your truth, there's my truth, and there's the truth. Fascinated, bro. Thank you so much Thank for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for watching at home and come back and join me again next week.